Hello, I'm Angeline Falk, Australian Information Commissioner and Privacy Commissioner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the start of Privacy Awareness Week 2021. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are watching. In 2021, we are in a time of transformation. We've all experienced how the pandemic accelerated uptake of digital technologies and more and more businesses moved online. This Privacy Awareness Week, privacy regulators around Australia have come together to call on organisations, government agencies and the public to make privacy a priority. We're highlighting what we all can and must do to prioritise privacy and protect personal information now and into the future. This is a call to action because by taking simple steps now, we can all benefit from data-driven innovation, enhance trust and consumer confidence and prevent harm. For individuals, always ask why, how and who before you share your information and use multi-factor authentication and strong passphrases as your first line of defence. And if you are caught up in a data breach, act quickly to reduce your risk of harm. For organisations, a privacy by design approach is critical. Develop an easy to read privacy policy and use training and technology to prevent data breaches caused by human error. We're launching Privacy Awareness Week with this special event, a seminar on making privacy a priority in the decade of data. This is also a time to consider how we shape our future. With Australia's Privacy Act under review, we have the opportunity to make sure we have the right regulation to better empower consumers, protect their data and best serve the Australian economy into this decade and beyond. The description of the 2020s as a decade of data was coined by UK Information Commissioner and Global Privacy Assembly Chair Elizabeth Denham, who I'm very pleased will provide an address following my remarks today and then join me for a conversation. As GPA Chair, She's a leader in promoting regulatory cooperation and a global environment with clear and consistently high standards of data protection. And while our domestic regulatory environments have critical differences, our experiences certainly have significant overlap. And that's been clearly demonstrated in the privacy response to COVID-19. Data protection regulators from around the world have spoken with one voice on key privacy issues taking a privacy by design approach to contact tracing apps and sharing health data for travel. But first I'll outline the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner's progress across our regulatory priorities and what lies ahead. In this time of transformation, privacy and the protection of personal information are a key issue for the community. Our recent survey of attitudes to privacy told us Privacy is a major concern for 70% of Australians and 87% want more choice and control over their personal information. They see the biggest privacy risks as identity theft and fraud, data security and breaches and digital services such as social media sites. And concerns are based on experience as nearly 60% had a problem with how their data was used over the past year. So in line with what the community is telling us, we've nominated four areas of focus to guide our regulatory actions, minimise the risk of harm to individuals and provide consistency and certainty for business. Our regulatory action takes a number of forms, education and voluntary compliance, audits, making recommendations to reduce privacy risks, determinations where I can order remedial action and enforcement action for civil penalties through the courts for serious or repeated interferences with privacy. And we also investigate and conciliate complaints from individuals. And I'm pleased to report we have addressed a backlog of complaints through initiatives made possible by additional resources. We're also determining more complaints than ever. And that provides important precedence for practitioners. So turning to our regulatory priorities, firstly, online platforms, social media and high privacy impact technologies. The global digital economy offers Australian consumers and businesses significant opportunities. It can also carry significant privacy risks. 
Our goal is to shift the environment so organisations provide consumers with greater choice and control and build in systems and processes to protect personal information up front. We've got regulatory actions and investigations on foot that seek to hold global digital businesses to account. That includes our federal court action in relation to Facebook that I commenced last year. My office and Commissioner Denham's office are jointly investigating Clearview AI over its use of scraped data and biometrics for its facial recognition app. And we have been working with international regulators to hold video conferencing providers to account in demonstrating how they meet their privacy obligations. This priority area is one where regulatory frameworks intersect domestically and internationally, including data and consumer protection. Regulators must continue to cooperate and collaborate and use all the tools at our disposal to regulate global tech. Take last month's federal court ruling that Google engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct in collecting location data from Android phones. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, took the case under consumer law, but it has implications for privacy practice and it supports the OAIC's call for greater simplicity and clarity in privacy policies and notices. Looking ahead, we should soon see a draft exposure bill for the online privacy code, which will enhance effective regulation, along with infringement notices, and an increase in the value of penalties I can seek through the court. Our second priority is the security of personal information. In 2019-20, we received 1,050 notifiable data breaches and we expect a similar number this year. The NDB scheme is now a well-established mechanism which should motivate a proactive stance. Our twice yearly report calls out the causes and areas where entities need to focus and most breaches still involve a human element, like employees who are lured into providing their credentials to malicious actors. And we do expect organisations to do more to mitigate this risk through training, systems and procedures. And in our last NDB report, we raised concerns with delay in assessing and reporting data breaches. Delayed notifications mean people can't take timely steps to protect themselves from harm. Looking ahead, we will prioritise regulatory action where there are significant failings to protect personal information, particularly where we've called out the risks or mitigations or where organisations fall short of reporting requirements. Our third priority is regulating the consumer data right. This new data portability right gives consumers more choice and control over their data. In its planned application across the economy, it is world-leading and designed to drive innovation. And it's founded on a privacy-by-design approach with strong accountability measures for businesses who are accredited and given access to data by consent for a set period. As a co-regulator of the system, our aim is to help providers understand and comply with their privacy obligations so consumers can share their data with confidence and we're working with Treasury and the ACCC as it rolls out across the economy. It's a clear example of how privacy safeguards and competition and consumer protection work together in the public interest. And we have a role to help ensure the CDR privacy safeguards are interoperable at the global level. Our fourth priority is personal information handling practices arising from COVID-19. Like all data protection and privacy authorities, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the work we do. Our Community Attitudes Survey told us most Australians agree some concessions must be made to privacy protections to combat COVID-19 for the greater good, so long as they're not permanent. And, and three quarters believe COVID doesn't excuse business or government from meeting their usual obligations under privacy laws. So we have an ongoing role to play to ensure responsible personal information handling across public health initiatives. We supported amendments to the Privacy Act to legislate strong privacy protections and expand my office's regulatory role and powers in relation to the COVID Safe app. We're assessing the implementation of those protections and reporting twice yearly on how we exercise our regulatory functions. 
And we've also, of course, published considerable guidance on COVID safe, contact tracing and information for employers. Supporting positive economic and public health outcomes, we will continue to engage and advise on a range of COVID-related privacy issues, the vaccine rollout, the use of health information by employers and in facilitating travel, and we'll be seeking a consistent high standard of personal information handling. The backdrop to this regulatory activity is, of course, the current review of Australia's Privacy Act led by the Attorney-General's Department. Next in this process, the Department will release a discussion paper for consultation before it makes recommendations to government later this year. So in the decade of data, this is the chance to make sure our privacy law is fit for purpose. We've brought our regulatory experience to the table uh, with proposals to give Australia a fair and flexible framework that meets the needs and challenges of the future. It should protect privacy rights, prevent harms and hold organisations to account. In some of our key recommendations to the review, we propose changes that enhance individuals' choice and control, but we say notice and consent should be limited to where it can be meaningful, not expanded more broadly to permit any data handling practice. Individuals should not get a take-it-or-leave-it choice where the only alternative is not to engage with the product or service as often the cost of opting out is too high. And we also see the need for a clear obligation on business to handle personal data both fairly and reasonably. And we ask whether some data handling practices may need to be limited or indeed prohibited in the public interest. For example, should a shopping centre be able to use facial recognition to read our mood when we look at products? Should a home assistant device be able to listen in on our conversations for voice training purposes, even if they tell us that in their privacy policy? And should someone be able to purchase spyware to track a domestic partner without their knowledge? For organisations already committed to good privacy practice, these standards and protections wouldn't impose undue compliance burdens, but they will allow good practice to be rewarded as all regulated entities across government and business would have to demonstrate fairness in the way they handle personal information and in line with community expectations. Such a framework also needs a regulator who has the right regulatory tools and resources to act in line with those expectations, proportionately and on the basis of evidence. As we navigate through the pandemic and into recovery, data, digital, cybersecurity and smart regulatory design are seen as key to our continued economic success. Personal data and its protection is integral to the vision of Australia as a world leader in the digital economy. Our recommendations to the review are designed to support a system that's technologically neutral and flexible to suit organisation circumstances with specific requirements where needed and in areas of higher risk. That gives certainty to business and government while providing for fairness and accountability. That supports global interoperability and minimises regulatory friction to help drive economic growth and innovation. And that fosters confidence and encourages digital participation by all Australians while protecting their fundamental rights. As we often say, Data knows no borders and Australians should also have confidence that their personal information will be appropriately protected wherever it flows. For privacy regulators, that means cooperation, it means the exchange of ideas, it means joint initiatives. Which brings me to our next speaker, our guest today, Elizabeth Denham, CBE, was appointed UK Information Commissioner in 2016 after serving as Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia and Assistant Privacy Commissioner of Canada. In October 2018, Commissioner Denham was appointed Chair of the Global Privacy Assembly. As a member of the GPA Executive Committee, I've had the pleasure of working with Commissioner Denham on several global privacy initiatives, including coordinated approaches to Facebook and the Libra Network's proposed cryptocurrency, video conferencing platforms and our joint investigation into Clearview. I expect our relationship with the ICO to further strengthen in line with the memorandum of understanding we have in place, 
which recognises that the nature of the modern global economy requires cross-border enforcement cooperation. On these issues and more, I introduce our special guest for the launch of Privacy Awareness Week 2021, Commissioner Elizabeth Denham. Thank you for that wonderful, warm introduction, Angeline, and happy Privacy Awareness Week to all of my colleagues in, in Australia. Australia is a long way from where I'm sitting right now, which is in Lond our London Trafalgar Square office. But the theme of privacy as a priority is one that feels very close to me. And I've worked in privacy roles, both as a practitioner and as a regulator for more than two decades. And I've seen the profession grow and evolve, and I think especially in recent years. I used to spend my time persuading organizations to take data protection and privacy seriously. And now I increasingly spend my time hearing others ask, how can we make privacy a priority? So whether that's government departments, local government bodies, or innovative companies, the value of privacy is increasingly understood. But that doesn't make the job of a privacy practitioner any easier. And I was speaking to a group of DPOs, as we call them, data protection officers recently, and they were talking about the enormous challenges that they face in their roles. Primarily, they don't have enough resources and there aren't enough hours in the day. And I'm sure many of you that are listening to this presentation will share that view. I mean, it's been an extraordinary year. Data was so central to government initiatives and business initiatives this year as governments and society responded to the unprecedented global pan pandemic. And that meant a very busy year, as we've just heard from Angeline, for regulators in digital and data. And I know it's been a busy year for all of you as practitioners. We have been answering difficult questions, unprecedented questions with high stakes and short deadlines. The view from where I stand, both as the UK's information commissioner and as chair of the Global Privacy Assembly is that our community has really stepped up. We've shown that data protection laws and the posture of data protection authorities is practical, it's flexible, and it's absolutely crucial in encouraging public trust in new measures, new services, and innovation. But as you well know, we have a lot more work to do. And as our digital world continues to evolve at pace, and as regulation looks to keep up, it's important that all of us lift our heads up as much as we can to see what's coming down the track. And I think the, the main message and the direction of travel around the world is towards greater protection for consumers and citizens and stronger privacy rights. So it's only going in one direction. So increased protection and increased regulation is something that our citizens, our policymakers, and our consumers are asking for. And Angeline mentioned the survey that was conducted by her office that found nine out of 10 Australians wanted more choice and more control over their personal information. And our research in the UK shows similar results. But a common misconception that I hear is that an increase in privacy protections 
means copying and pasting GDPR and putting it in place around the world. And as a Canadian working in the UK, that isn't the case. The GDPR is not a perfect law. I've called it a toddler law because it has some steps to take. But what it is, is the most modern set of rules and responsibilities that we have in the data protection world. It's the latest law in ongoing evolution. And Angeline's talking about where Australian policymakers are looking to evolve the, the law there. So obviously the GDPR will have some provisions that reflect modern privacy regulation. I think the next generation of privacy legislation will take inspiration not just from the GDPR and some of those provisions that are so important, like enforceable accountability, like higher sanctions for organizations that are meaningful, and stronger powers for the regulators to act in the digital economy. One aspect that I expect we'll see increasingly considered is how to mandate coordinated digital regulation. And I'm sure as practitioners, you will have experienced yourself that privacy considerations increasingly encompass legal, technological, and societal issues. And regulation has to reflect this. In the UK, this has taken the form of commitments from my office to work more closely with our regulatory partners to launch the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum that brings together my office, the Competition and Markets Authority, and the UK's Communications Regulator. So that is the future of regulation. I think more cooperation more collaboration, and also making sure that when we overlay analog regulatory structures onto the digital world of today, we create overlaps and not gaps. Because gaps, I think, are really the problem. Gaps in regulation mean that people's rights aren't properly protected, and we risk losing their trust and their engagement in digital innovation. So our research shows that data leaks and hacks have a direct impact on people's broader trust and confidence in how companies and organizations store and how they use their data. So it's for this reason that international data protection standards are so important. And if, if you just take phone apps as an example, the shop front of the app store on your phone masks the borderless nature of this industry. Or to put it another way, someone who's downloading the latest social media app in Canberra doesn't always realize that they're sharing their data with a company in California or Canada or Cambodia. So we know that the digital world increases innovation and consumer choice, but it means that data is flowing in larger volumes than ever before and expanding faster and scaling up more than what the experts predicted even a year ago. So we know that the pandemic and lockdowns have further stimulated expansion and people's data travels internationally, but the protections that exist for their data vary. And in some jurisdictions, protections don't exist at all. So the answer in, in my view is an international instrument that governs the flow of data 
we are increasingly seeing a convergence globally on a set of principles to achieve this. I spoke a few months ago to the World Bank's Privacy Day, and I spoke about the need for a Bretton Woods type conference, an international convention to take forward data flows with trust. And I hope that we can see progress on this important area in the coming year. So what I've done in my opening remarks is I've given you a whistle stop tour of what's coming down the track. And I think what is clear both across the last year and in the future is the value of good data protection. So over the last year, whether it's around live facial recognition technology or COVID contact tracing apps or vaccine certifications, I've seen that demonstrating good data protection compliance, transparency, fairness is crucial in building trust and maintaining trust that maximizes the impact of innovation. And that's as true with cross-government projects as it is with small business innovation. Some concluding points. We need to be building in privacy protections at the start. We need to be spending time to explain to people how their data is used, even when that might be difficult. And we need to be asking ourselves not what can we do with people's data, but what is fair. So whatever the future holds, those key principles remain sound and they remain true. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I look forward to our conversation, Angeline. Well, thank you, Liz. And thank you so much for those very insightful remarks and really drawing on the depth and breadth of your experience that you've gained over many years but also more recently in navigating the UK and the ICO, it's privacy issues as they've come up in, in the pandemic context. And to start our conversation, it feels like that's where we need to start talking in relation to COVID-19, which of course has impacted every corner of our lives, including privacy. Um, I'm interested in your experience of how the COVID responses changed the privacy environment and, and what role privacy can play in our recovery from the pandemic and, and how it can promote commerce and innovation and indeed support our economic well-being. I think that the COVID, the pandemic, and then and now as we as we work towards the economic recovery, I think this pandemic has challenged our community as never before. The genie is really out of the bottle. So that means that um, businesses and governments expect to be able to use data in new ways. And I think it, it has um, also been fascinating to see how people have reacted to some of these new initiatives. So on the one hand, I think citizens around the world understood that for a public health emergency, their data would be used and for the public good, as you say. But what I'm hearing now, the attitude is questioning how sticky um, these initiatives and the use of data and the sharing of data is going to be in the future. And I do think that the civil society groups um, and regulators' eyes will be on whether or not any any continuing collection, use and disclosure of personal information post pandemic is reasonable and fair. So we are going to see that. The other thing on the, if you have colleagues that are working in the government sector, I have seen um, the usual silos and the boundaries between health, education, uh, social care, 
we've seen those break down. And I think government is go going to want to use data in increasingly new ways to be able to perform public policy work and to intervene in people's lives in ways that they haven't in the past. So again, more joined up data use. I think we will see the ambition of getting more value from health data. And I think that all businesses scaled across the economy because they're online, again, have adopted broader and deeper use of personal data. So in Australia, uh, like the UK, uh, the issue of the use of personal information has been to the fore, Liz, and uh, one of the things that I've observed is just a very highly engaged Australian community on privacy issues. Um, as you say, there's an acceptance that data needs to be used in, in new and innovative ways to help stop and the spread of COVID-19 and, and manage the pandemic. But there's also been a very strong sense of the need for personal information to continue to be protected in that context. And I think we also saw that in in terms of video conferencing and us all moving to, to work from home. Uh, there was a uh, uh, engagement by the community around, well, how safe and secure is it for our children to be learning in this environment? Uh, and what about cybersecurity risks in that work from home environment? Um, so I think it's really focused the attention um, that business, government, the community has, has really um, moved at speed to uh, adopt uh, and new technologies, but they've also wanted to see those protections. Um, but Liz, I think even before um, the pandemic, um, you and I have both seen over the past few years um, that it's been a, a pivotal time for data practices, for community awareness and for privacy regulation generally. Um, and there's been some critical changes that have taken place and particularly you've referred to the GDPR. Um, so what do you think those changes have been from, from your perspective and which ones have really been the game changes um, from the ICO? I think, as I say, I think that the GDPR reflected, the, the, the coming into force of the GDPR happened at the same time as we saw some, um, some misuse of personal data in the context, for example, of uh, political campaigns. So I think um, the investigation that our office did and, and many jurisdictions joined in, in looking at the use of data in, in digital campaigns, we the Cambridge Analytica uh, Facebook investigation, I think brought home to people that data use, analytics, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence was making an impact on our political system. So the same kind of um, the same kind of techniques that we were used to in selling us cars and and trainers and holidays was now being used to serve us um, messages in political campaigns. And I think in 2018, two things converged. The passing of the GDPR, which had extraterritorial impact around the world, and Facebook Cambridge Analytica, that case, that black swan case, as I, as I call it, meant the data protection and privacy was a dinnertime conversation around the world. So, I think data protection has come of age, and I'm sure your community of data protection practitioners and, and privacy practitioners feel that. Um, it, we're important. We are working at the, at, at the apex of technology and law and society on issues that absolutely matter. And I think uh, you know, I think the law is getting stronger and people having more awareness, Angeline, have been game changers. But that particular investigation into political campaigning, I think, uh, made a difference. I think 2018 also made clear 
the uh, the importance of enforcement powers needed by a modern regulator. And so, you know, the ICO's ability to seize data um, from cloud servers to be able to stand up a no notice inspection. These were all very new powers for a privacy protection authority. I think, um, Liz, you've called out some of the the real the the real risks in the environment that that you've addressed through your regulatory toolkit, uh, and uh, other regulators have then drawn upon the work that you've done. Um, in Australia, I think the landscape similarly has really shifted since two thousand and eighteen. Of course, the GDPR had some impact for Australia for global entities that are, were operating around the world, um, but also for the community in terms of a greater awareness of data protection rights and an expectation that they be mirrored in Australia. We also had the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme start at the beginning of 2018, and that meant for the first time there was greater transparency in, in what was happening with people's data. Um, we moved then into the My Health Record system here, where the community really wanted greater protections for their health information, uh, and also the consumer data right, which has additional protections in place than our general privacy framework. Things like accreditation or a form of certification up front to engage in that system, uh, clear and fully informed consent and the ability to, to manage that. Um, as well as the ability to delete information and have a direct right of court action uh, for interferences with, with privacy in that, in that case, have all come together. Um, and if we add to that, uh, you referred to the Cambridge Analytica case, and then in Australia we had the ACCC's Digital Platforms Inquiry report, um, which really lifted the lid on the data handling practices that were occurring in our domestic environment. Uh, and that's really led us to where we are now in Australia with this review of the Privacy Act and this opportunity for us to, to look at the international models and to, to adapt them and ensure that they're fit for purpose in the uh, domestic Australian context. Um, so, Liz, you talked about some of those regulatory tools that became available to you through the GDPR, um, but I'm interested in, in the other ways in which... Um, the ICO has navigated some of those regulatory challenges and I know that you've had some innovations around sandboxes and collaboration. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to talk about our range of tools and, and programs because what we are as data protection regulators uh, is we are facilitators of innovation as well as protectors of personal data. And if we take account of the importance of the digital economy, we need to be able to support good practice and support innovators that are maybe pushing at the edges of what we have seen in the past. And so what the ICO does is we spend 75% of our time supporting organizations by giving them clear guidance formal commissioners' opinions, and allowing them to beta test, organizations to beta test their new initiatives with the ICO. And I think 75% of our, our work really goes to support organizations to get it right, to build in privacy by design, and the rest of our resources goes into enforcing the law when there's been malicious or purposeful contravention of the law. And so we have the sanctions at the end of the day to use when we need them, but it seems like a systems failure to me when we have to use our fines, our stop processing orders. Um, what I would much rather do is build in those privacy by design elements up front. And so we have really strengthened our innovation and technology team. I think when I started in 2016, we had two technologists. We now have 25. We've built um, we've built the sandbox. We have a grants and innovation program. 
so that we can pour, we can support independent research. All of these things are really important. And we tilt towards helping rather than enforcing at the end of the day. That's really interesting. And it's it's interesting the extent to which you really focusing on those um, enabling type tools that you have. Um, and in Australia at present, for the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme, we're working really closely with every entity that reports a breach to us to make sure that they're putting in place the remedial actions, they're rectifying and making sure that it's not repeated into the future. And there's a lot of value, I think, that we play as regulators in helping businesses navigate through that terrain uh, when something does go wrong. But importantly, as you've called out, um, proactively working to um, allow uh, our, our views, our guidance, um, our advisory views of, of issues to be taken into account um, when businesses and, and government indeed are developing new programs that impact personal information. Um, so, Liz, we now uh, find ourselves in 2021 in this decade of data um, that you've coined. Um, uh, and many of the privacy issues that, that you and I are seeing are playing out in that digital environment. Um, and that's also one of the factors that's driving that closer intersection between domestic and international frameworks and between data protection and consumer protection and competition, you know, online safety and even content regulation. Um, so what's your view on how we should be approaching this over the next decade? You've talked about issues of collaboration and cooperation and the intersection of those legal frameworks. What does that look like from your perspective moving forward? I think going forward, the I think the institutional boundaries of some of our, our regulators aren't going to look the same five or 10 years from now. Because I think in taking on digital, we have to work across competition, content regulation, consumer protection and data protection. So we need to consider how we can meaningfully carry those, those policies forward to protect people. And you, in, in Australia, Again, there's lots of discussion around portability, data portability, and, and whether that provision is, is best enforced by the competition regulator or by the data protection regulator. And we're having the same conversations here. And what I think is we're never going to have one single digital regulator in jurisdictions. That's a very complex arena. But... If anything, Angeline, we're going to be working closer together um, than we ever have before. And so those institutional arrangements domestically will look differently. When it comes to international collaboration, especially enforcement cooperation, we need, and through the GPA we're doing this, we need to enforce together against um, practices that we see across the world and carried on by companies, the, the likes of which I think we've never seen before. So it's so important to be able to take action together and we are going to need a team to be able to enforce properly. And what does that mean? That's not just information sharing, but it's parallel and joint investigations as we are doing in, in Clearview AI. Because again, the border, the borderless world, the digital world, means that we have to work together. And as I said, I, I think we need a multi, multilateral agreement on standards of data protection so that we can work across at least liberal democracies in, in, in better and more effective ways. I just wanted to say um, one more thing that I think relates back to our earlier question and answer, which is what I've learned in 18 years as a regulator in, in different jurisdictions, you need three things for important protections to be in place. You need a strong law, an effective law. You need the resources to be able to 
enforce the law. And sometimes you need the, the courage, especially to go first with a new initiative, with an investigation of an entire ecosystem, as we did in the UK on um, the use of data in political campaigns. So I think those are really critical elements for regulators to have. And I am just so proud of the work that particularly the executive has carried out at the GPA in the last year, because I think we've needed all of those things to be able to, to steer the environment towards protection and enabling innovation. Indeed. Um, and I, I think the, the issues that you're calling out there, um, Liz, of course, resonate for me in terms of looking at ensuring that we've got the right legal frameworks in place that will enable the kind of cross-border regulatory cooperation that's required in order to you know, regulate some digital platforms that are as big as nation states and that it does take a, you've called it a team effort, a, a collective effort of, of laws and regulators both domestically and internationally uh, to ensure that we are protecting personal information in this environment and in some cases that's going to require a data protection response. In, in others, it's going to be a, a consumer protection response. Um, and, and I think some of the, the other issues that we um, uh, have looked at from the GPA's perspective around how do we make sure those frameworks intersect, how do we ensure uh, for, for business that the data can, can flow in a way that reduces the friction, um, reduces confusion in regulatory terms, but also protects citizens' data wherever it flows uh, and that we need those tools, whether that's in our domestic laws or international type arrangements, that it's really going to help us into this next decade. Um, and, and Liz, in your speech, you, you talked about the issue of, of fairness and I, I remember at a, one of the international conferences over the years you talking about that provision in the GDPA is potentially um, in GDPR being a sleeper issue. Um, from my perspective, I see the issues of fairness as really knitting together some of those regulatory frameworks that we've been talking about. Um, and I have recommended to government that Australia's privacy law contain a requirement to have you know, fair and, and reasonable uh, personal information handling practices. Um, is that something that's playing out in the UK? Absolutely. And I think the provision of fairness in our laws and in the GDPR has been underexplored. Um, and it needs to be explored. We need jurisprudence. We need cases and investigations that look at fairness. It's so incredibly important in a world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And where I think we need to, to go is that the decade of data that we're talking about today should really be a decade of data for good. And that will that means fairness is a critical center pillar there. So, I mean, we, we've spent a lot of time as data protection authorities and privacy commissioners investigating data breaches we have investigated many data breaches. We do good reporting, as you mentioned, in what are the, I mean, what are the reasons, what are the, what's the source of, and what is the risk of certain data practices that are leading to breaches, the public cares. But we need to also look at the fairness of systems. And fairness connects to ethics, which is why I think it's really important that data protection authorities also have ethicists that are working either within the authority or take advice from an external authority as we do. But fairness in an era of machine learning is absolutely critical. And that's where I think data protection authorities need to go next. Um, that issue of public interest has of course been central through the pandemic. Um, and looking at data protection rights as something that possibly more of a collective interest rather than just individual interests, I can see us moving in that direction. In the public health uh, system, for example, 
Um, we see that if people feel confident around the handling of their sensitive health data, then they'll seek medical assistance. And, of course, that's got societal and economic and public health goods uh, more generally. Um, so we've talked about this privacy landscape, um, Liz, from a regulatory perspective, you know, how it's changed, uh, what that means moving forward. Um, but as our, our final point of discussion, um, I think the audience would be really interested on your views of how the role of the privacy practitioners also changing, and you touched a little bit on that in your remarks. Um, there are uh, challenges that they're facing. What do you think that's going to look like as the decade plays out? Um, and indeed, what do you see as the, the data protection priorities for business and government for the future? Um, first of all, I, I think practitioners, data protection officers, chief privacy officers, um, legal experts that are responsible in their agencies for compliance, you have an incredibly challenging and an important role. So I was a chief privacy officer um, back before the turn of the last century where it was mostly a, a back office job to be a compliance officer at a time when new laws were coming in in the 1990s. And I was in the health sector at that time. And it was it was hard to get an audience with the senior executive to say why privacy is, is so important. But now, as we've talked about, Angeline, businesses do get it. We see more and more discussions of data protection, cybersecurity, and other protections through the environmental, uh, sustainability and, and governance programs in the private sector. So I think there's a piece of it there and data for good fits there. But data protection practitioners need to do their day job, which is about educating the organization, looking at data protection impact assessments, guiding organizations to make the, the right decisions. But you're also like an internal watchdog at the same time, and you have a relationship with the regulator. So those are really, really tough jobs. At the end of the day, the most successful data protection officers and practitioners are those that have street cred with the organization they work for. So a deep understanding of the business structure and the business models of organizations they absolutely work, they work with, and also, you can't do it alone. So we talked about privacy being a team sport. And in an organization, you do need a network of colleagues touching across the organization to be able to support you in, in that role. So if I was a data protection officer, I would build a strong network to be the eyes and ears um, for ethical use of data and strong data protection practices. Privacy has made it into the C-suite in businesses and organizations. Part of the reason for that is cybersecurity and, and the concern that executives and boards have about cyber. So again, it's not a back office job. It needs to be a front of mind program throughout the organization. And, um, you know, I just think practitioners are incredibly important in the future and seeing the decade of, of data resulting in data for good. So I think practitioners are, are just key to the key to um, key to the puzzle in the future of data. Well, thank you, Liz. On, on that note, I'd like to really uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise on the role of data protection practitioners, intersection of regulatory frameworks, what the, the decade of data looks like and the way in which we need to have our legal frameworks fit for purpose into the next decade. Um, it's a conversation that I think we could have for, for many hours um, and there's lots of points that I could highlight, but I feel what it's done is really reinforce that Australia needs to continue to look beyond our borders when it comes to developing you know, the best privacy framework and uh, there's no slowdown either in the pace of privacy challenges that we all face. Um, and as I said in my introduction, this is a time to consider indeed how we shape our future. 
so I hope for those watching that you've had um, uh, an opportunity to be suitably energised by the presentations and discussion, that you have a heightened commitment to be proactive on privacy and that you'll ensure privacy is built into all initiatives by design. Thank you for your time and I urge you to make privacy a priority this week and every week. Thank you.